Welcome back, lecture 26, and we are going to talk about real gas. So in the, on the, in the previous lecture, we discussed about the relativistic, uh, ultra-relativistic particles in a, in a gas. And we saw how things were corrected in terms of heat capacity, internal energy, pressure, and things like that. But we were still uh, obeying, uh, so that gas was still obeying the, the ideal gas law. And remember, the ideal gas law looked something like this where PV was equal to uh, nRT, where n is the number of mole. Okay, remember that we have the number of mole and we are using the uh, gas constant R. We can also have the version PV equal capital N KBT, where capital N would be the number of particles. The point remains that this uh, equation that we have seen so many times, this uh, equation of state, uh, is for an ideal gas where we have made the, the number of assumptions. The first assumption is that the molecule have, are point-like, and second, they do not uh, interact with, each, with one another. So uh, go back to one of the early uh, lecture. Uh, the title of that lecture was Pressure, where we use the kinetic theory of gas to prove this equation from scratch using the uh, Maxwell-Boltzmann equation. And what we, what we did there, if you, if you remember, is that we found this equation from the fact that because the gas is, is in a volume V, uh, there is a pressure on the wall of that container. And that pressure can be calculated by looking at the uh, statistical uh, distribution of, of velocity. So this pressure, basically P, that shows on the, on the left-hand side here, is actually related to uh, the collision of the gas with the walls. It does, and each and the molecule uh, behave uh, do not interact uh, uh, directly or, in, or indirectly. So it turns out that this, this equation is very uh, accurate in many instances, uh, especially when the density of, of, the, of the gas is fairly low. Okay, we are going to, we are going to discuss this uh, more in detail in, in, a, few, in a few minutes. Uh, the idea is that if it's, if it's a low density, the, the probability of interaction goes down Therefore, neglecting something that's, that can be neglected uh, is, is a good approximation, basically. We'll, we'll get back to this. However, things start to, to, to fall down, especially when you look at uh, the, uh, the, the crossover between a gas and a liquid. So the liquefaction is definitely not going to be well described by such an equation, uh, simply because when we have liquefaction, we have a high density and the molecules start to interact with each other. And then... Uh, each time the inter intermolecular interactions start to matter, uh, this equation also is, is going to break down. So in this lecture today, we are going to look at a couple of, uh, of, of, of uh, improvement upon this equation and see uh, the, the new uh, features that are going to emerge from this equation. So one of them, one of the equations that we are going to introduce is the Van der Waals interaction. I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on it. Uh, we are going to, to also introduce the dire uh, rich shy uh, equation. Um, I'm going to have to apologize for the pronunciation of this name. So it's coming from, the name comes from Konrad Dieter rich I, uh, si, I don't exactly know how to pronounce this. It was a German phys, uh, physicist. Um, I would have thought that it would be pronounced like an Italian name, but it's a German physicist. And I could not find uh, another pronunciation than uh, dietary uh, size. So I'm going to use that pronunciation and I will apologize in advance for if I'm butchering this. And finally, we'll talk about the virial uh, 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 expansion, which, which is basically a, a, a common ground, if you will, for, for, uh, for all the improvement upon, uh, upon the, the real gas law. Let's, let's do this. Okay, so let's start right away with the Van der Waals gas. So what we want to add is basically the two main features that are missing, which is to add an attractive force or an, attra an attractive interaction between the molecules, which we know they, they in, in interact, and also a repulsive uh, uh, interaction, which is actually related to non-zero size of the molecule. So I have to spend a couple of, of, of seconds on this. Why, why do we connect the non-zero size of a molecule with its uh, repulsive part? Well, 
basically the the zero the, the fact that the molecules or the particles in general have a size means that the other particle cannot get any closer to than than the size of the molecule to the center of the molecule so basically the size of the molecule is going to define a forbidden space a forbidden region for the other molecule, for the other molecules to enter so in practice that means it's a repulsive term in fact it's it goes back to a notion that we introduce a few lectures ago about the heart sphere potential. It's essentially saying that the heart sphere of finite size and does not allow the other molecule to get inside. So it's definitely a repulsive, a repulsive term, uh, a very hard term. When we say hard, it means that it's very, it, it, it shoots up very quickly as you get close to, to, the, to, the, to, to the world, so inside the region of that sphere. So, well, so basically saying that the molecule have a non-zero size uh, is saying that we are including the repulsive part. And uh, then we are going to introduce the attractive interaction as well. So let me just show you the equation right away, and then we are going to, to take some time to dissect the equation to understand it. Uh, this equation, uh, in fact, um, introduced two terms. So the first term is the, fir the term B, that's the easiest term to understand. B is essentially changing uh, the, the, the volume of the molecule, uh, uh, the, the volume per mole, if you will. So the, the, that's, the, that's the total volume divided by the number of mole. Uh, so we are essentially renormalizing that volume for, for a mole by subtracting a term. And that term is actually corresponding to the non-zero size of the molecule. So we, we get this, okay? We understand that we reduce the volume available uh, for the other molecule, basically. Now, the second term we add is this term, a over v square m, or I should even say plus a over v square m. And this is a term that we are going to, to spend a couple of minutes understanding in, in, a, in the next slide or two. So first of all, before we go any further than this, uh, we, there, are two things that, there are a few things that we need to understand. First of all, we introduce two new parameters, a and b. Okay? Imagine that a and b were equal to zero, we would end up with the same equation as we had before, right? PV equal RT. Uh, well, we have an N missing, but since we're using the volume per mole, it's actually, it's actually still there, okay? So if A and B is a zero, so if we neglect the intermolecular attraction and the, 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 the repulsion, basically, we end up with the ideal gas law, which is, of course, a good limiting case because we know it's correct. Uh, it's pretty good. <laughs> so uh, that's good that we reproduce the limiting case. So on top of that, this, this also shows that, uh, that uh, and we have, after we justify all the terms, that uh, at very low density, just I mentioned to you, so very uh, low density, in other words, a very large volume per mole, right? So if, if each mole is, uh, has a very large volume, um, that means it's a very low density. So at very uh, low density, uh, this, terms, this term here, uh, cancels, right? And uh, this term here is much larger than this term. So in other words, again, at very low density, so very large Vm, we end up also with the van der Waals gas. And, and we understand that again, because if it's a low density, the probability for a given molecule to interact with another one, repulsively or attractively, is very low. So in other words, the van der Waals uh, gas reduces to the ideal gas law. So, so far, so good. Nothing really um, uh, earth shattering too much until we have explained this term here. And it's what we are going to do. But let's try to understand this term. So first of all, we are going to consider this, all this molecule or these particles inside the gas. And we are going to say that they are going to interact uh, with each other uh, attractively with an average effective uh, attraction of uh, magnitude A. So this is the average, okay? So we only use one A, okay? This is the, 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 the expectation value of the interaction, if you will. So let's try to, to understand this term. Well, first of all, uh, each molecule is going to, in to interact with the other, uh, each mole is going to interact with other moles, right? So, the, so that means that um, the number of, of molecules that a given molecule will in interact with is proportional to that number, right? The larger the number, the larger the, the larger the interaction. So clearly, the number of of a molecule that a, that a molecule we interact with is proportional to 
the number of mole divided by the volume, right? Very good. So, and divided by the volume comes from the fact that you you this you are you are you are um, you have to renormalize for the for the for the neighbor neighbors uh, of that molecule. Okay, good. Now, second, if we suppose that the in average interaction with those neighbors is a, we are going to have an interaction for a given mole of a times number of mole divided by the volume. But of course, each of the molecule, each of the mole, again, in that in in the gas, are going to have that average interaction. So, in other words, the total energy, the total interaction energy, will be would be equal to a n square mole divided by v. Okay, so that's that's going to give me the, if you will, the shift downwards of the total energy, um, because uh, uh, because of the interaction. So it's, it's downward because it's of course attractive. Therefore, it's a, it's a, it's a um, stabilizing factor. Nice. Now imagine that you have this interaction for volume and you change the volume. So you try to see how what's the variation of this energy when you when you modify the volume. Well, you have to calculate the derivative of this term with respect to the volume. Since the volume is in the den denominator, you end up with a minus one over v squared. So basically you end up with this. So a change in volume will give a change in energy. This is just a simple uh, derivative. Very nice. So why is this nice? Well, because if you look this, at this carefully, this change in energy, right? Um, we see a term times dv, in fact, minus a term times dv. And we've seen this before, right? Uh, an energy like this is changing energy that is proportional to dv. Uh, usually this is a pressure in front. Remember the minus pdv. So it looks like this is this term here looks like a pressure, like, like an effective pressure due to the fact that the uh, molecules are attracting each other. So in fact, this is exactly like you have, it's an, an effective uh, pressure, which are due to the uh, to the presence of the other molecule, uh, which is exactly this term in front here. So remember, I'm just repeat this. This is related to the fact that this change in energy when you change the volume looks like a work minus PDV that we have seen so many times in this course. So in other words, this looks like a pressure, right? This looks like a pressure, an effective pressure. But this effective pressure reduces the energy in the system. So this is the effective pressure due to the interaction. Now, if we, if we want, that means that compared to what we did before, which we were calling the ideal pressure, this pressure is actually uh, reduced, right? It is the pressure, the, 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 the total pressure, if you will, minus the effective pressure that we just calculated, right? Uh, so so the, the minus term here is because of the the actual pressure is uh, is modified, uh, so the, the the pressure is modified to get something that we had before in the ideal case. So when we put everything together, we find that the uh, what we used for the ideal gas law should actually be corrected by a term a plus v square over m. In other words, let me say that differently. A part of the ideal pressure is due to the pressure of the gas itself plus a correction due to the fact that there is an attraction, okay? So we can just go back to the ideal gas law and plug in this correction compared to what we used before. And so in that case, and if I also introduce a B for the, uh, for the change in volume, I end up with this term here, which is exactly the formula that we use for the Van der Waals interaction. So you see, this is a, this is a, a fairly um, straightforward way to to correct uh, what we have. Uh, now we have to see, of course, if it works or not. And when I say work, if it, does it fit the experimental data and so on, but we will see that in a minute. But before we do that, uh, let's try to understand the consequences of, of this correction uh, compared to the ideal gas law. So first of all, you can we, it's, we can rewrite this equation a number of ways. Uh, one way to write it is just using this cubic uh, uh, equation here, cubic in the volume. Uh, we can write this this way, no problem. And in fact, we can write, uh, we can uh, plot some isoterm. So the isoterm, this is something that we've done many times. Uh, if you remember for the ideal gas law, the isoterm is, is PV uh, is equal to a constant, right? This is, uh, if temperature is a parameter, uh, PV equal NRT, 
So um, we can do the same here and, and write the isotherm. Isotherm simply means that we plot, we use T as a parameter. So we plot different curves like this for different temperature. So what we find is that we get this PV uh, plot just using this equation. They're a little bit more complicated to do than what we had to do when for the ideal gas law, but not that complicated. But we see something interesting is that when the temperature is really high, uh, and we can see this equation here, when the temperature is really high, this term here can be neglected and things uh, look uh, pretty much almost the same as they were when, uh, when we had the ideal gas law. And it's the reason why this isotherms here, when the temperature is high, is pretty close to, are pretty close to the isotherms we had for the ideal gas law. Now, here's something that's, that's interesting, is that when we get to lower temperature, so when temperature goes down uh, verti vertically in this plot, we see there is a place where those simple uh, curves uh, start to adopt an S-shape. And the S-shape here comes from the fact that you have a cubic equation right here. And in fact, for very, very small volume, the term B start to to, uh, to be very important. So when the volume gets very close to B, uh, this becomes to get zero and a number times a zero should be equal to a finite number, right? The RT is a finite number for, for, for the temperature. And so we end up with the pressure as to overshoot to account for this. So this is the one where you have those very, very close uh, isotherm here at very low, at very low volume, which are very close to B. Of course, the volume lower than B makes no sense. Okay, that makes no sense. That's the reason why we stop, stop at B here. Good. Uh, so we have an ideal gas. Uh, we, have a, we have less and less of an ideal gas as the temperature goes down. Uh, and again, let me remind you the temperature goes down here. And there are a number of things that's happening in this area, and I'm going to discuss them in the next slide. Uh, one thing that you, that, that you have to realize is that uh, we start to see things that, and I'm just going to kind of a spoiler alert here. There are some places on this curve, for example, below the dark curve, which I'm going to explain in a minute, where a given pressure, so if you impose the external pressure, say, uh, correspond to two different volumes. And these are two solutions of this equation. And this is going to have a profound effect on the physics uh, of, of what we are talking about. Remember, that this is a, a feature that was not present in the ideal gas law, because in the ideal gas law, we just had PV is equal to a constant. So we did not have these features here. So let's, let's, let's just take this slowly so we understand what they are doing, what it's doing. So first of all, a way to measure this and to understand that this weird behavior here uh, is to look at what's called the isothermal compressibility. And we have introduced this. So the isothermal uh, compressibility is kappa of T. Uh, which is essentially the change in the volume when you change the pressure, okay, uh, at constant temperature. Now, we divide it by the volume. Remember, I explained this. We divide it by the volume because we don't want these numbers to be volume dependent. Of course, the change in volume is going to increase linearly with the volume uh, will be proportional to, the, to the, the, the total volume. So if we divide by the volume, we, do, we, we, we normalize for the volume, if you will. And the minus sign here comes from the fact that the volume usually uh, decreases when you increase uh, the pressure. So we want this number to be positive uh, in, 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 in normal circumstances. Okay. Now, uh, here's the problem. This is related to minus the derivative of volume with respect to the pressure. And this is a positive number here, no problem. Okay, these are just these are just go, these are going down. So in other words, the, the derivative is, is is good. Now the problem is when you end up in this area, for example, or this area, or this area, all those areas correspond to a negative compressibility. So this this uh, number here is actually negative. Okay, so so this is something that's a little bit weird. A negative compressibility means that if you are increasing the pressure the volume goes down or actually if you um, I'm sorry if you are increasing the pressure the volume goes up which is unusual so you are basically pushing on your on your let's imagine a gas and then you are pushing harder and harder and the harder the more you push so the more you apply a high pressure the larger the volume gets so this is a little bit uh, of, a, of a surprise but this is what the model predicts and and we are going to explain that in a minute 
So this the, the issue is that if you are here, uh, you end up in a very unstable situation because if you push on, if there is a fluctuation in pressure, okay, a change in pressure from outside, an external pressure, and the volume changes. But the fact the volume changes means that the system is doing work on the outside. So that means that then there is, it provides energy, which is then uh, can amplify the pressure fluctuation and, and therefore the, pro, the, the system, the, the instability feeds itself, if you will. So in other words, the system will be unstable. So when you have a negative compressibility, the system is unstable. So something is, is but it's predicted by the, by the, so that's by the, by the equations. So that's, that's what we have. So basically what happens is that there is a critical point uh, in these curves which are isotherm again, so they're all, all plotted for given temperature from the Van der Waals uh, uh, law of, of, uh, for, the, for the gas. And there is a point where these curves start to show a local minimum right here, okay? And this is called, and, and the point, the, 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 the curve, so the isotherm where this behavior starts is called the critical uh, isotherm. So this is the critical isotherm, and of course, the right before we obtain those local minima, we end up with an inflection point, right? So this is the critical uh, curve here, the critical uh, uh, isotherm, and this there is an inflection point. So this is where you almost have a minimum, but not quite. Uh, this is where both first and second derivatives are zero. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, also uh, that this, this, critical, this critical curve happens for a given temperature, and that temperature is called a critical temperature. So this is very important. So below the critical temperature, you start to have this weird behavior where you have a local minimum, correspond, which means that there are two possible volume for a given pressure. Okay, so this is, this is, this is something that's, that's quite, quite interesting, and we are going to discuss this more. Let's try to understand the critical point. So the critical point, and let me remind you, the critical point is when this equation has basically two solutions for a given pressure. That's what it is. And that means, and so the pressure is a function of, of the volume. So the critical point is going to happen uh, right when the existence of the minimum. But before the existence of the minimum, we have an inflection point in the curves. An inflection point is defined according to, to basic calculus from that the point where the first and second derivatives are zero. So that's what we have to calculate. So we actually basically calculate this curve here. And this is the first and second derivative of zero because of the relative simplicity of this functional form of the Van der Waals law, you can calculate these, these terms pretty easily. And the temperature and volume at which these equations will be zero will be, con will be called the, uh, the critical temperature and critical volume. So I'd like to, to remind you though, that this, term here, this derivative, is, uh, is, the in, is proportional to the inverse of the compressibility, uh, okay, the isothermal compressibility that we uh, defined a couple of slides ago. So in other words, at that place, the compressibility diverges. So any tiny changes in pressure is going to lead to an infinite change in volume. Okay, this is, this is where the, uh, the things start, this is why we call it critical. Okay, good. Uh, nice. So we can, if we apply this, we can find the value of T and V that are going to be zero for these two equations. And I'm going to let you do this. It's, it's very elementary. And we end up with uh, a temperature, critical temperature, critical volume. And of course, if we know the temperature and the volume, the critical temperature, critical volume, we can also calculate the, the pressure that correspond to those temperature and volume. So we get the, the, the critical pressure as well. And all this within this, this model here, okay? Uh, before I talk about this term here, I'd like to uh, tell you that the critical volume only depends on B, okay? So this is actually, uh, this is actually three times the, 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 the value of B, B being the size of the molecule. Uh, so the critical volume in the Van der Waals model is three times the size of the, the effective size of the molecule. Why the pressure depends on both A and B, as well as the temperature, the critical temperature and pressure. So one thing that we, we like to use in, uh, in all these models, and we'll see another example in a few minutes, is the ratio between uh, PCVC and RTC. Because what this ratio, and 
just plug it in from here, is independent on A and B. So in principle, if this model is applicable to many different uh, type of, of gas, uh, which obviously have different A and B, uh, so that model has a feature that this ratio here does not depend on A and B. So in principle, this number should be a uni universal for all the systems that can be described by this equation. And this number is actually 3, 8. And uh, we'll see uh, if, if the actual measurement can, can give us uh, that information as well. So let's try to keep going. And this, this now is going to be the hardest slide of the entire lecture. So uh, this is probably a good time to, to focus on, on what's happening. So we already know that the system is going to be unstable for temperature below or equal to, to, the, to the critical temperature. We just discussed this, OK, because of the, of the change because the compressibility is, is, is negative, basically. But let's try to understand this a bit better. So this is a critical uh, slide, and this is where we are going to talk about uh, more thermodynamics. So just, just to remind you, we can write uh, the equation of, uh, of Van der Waals uh, this way. Okay, we have uh, the, the term, uh, the two different terms in this case. Okay, now let's go back to this plot. And uh, this is a plot you've seen, but uh, it's one that's turned 90 degrees. So now, uh, actually, the volume was on the x-axis and the pressure was on the y-axis on the previous cases I showed you. Now, we have to turn this 90 degrees, and you will understand a second, a few, in a few seconds why. And remember what I mentioned to you, some of the isotherm below the, temp the critical temperature, which is the case, right? We are 90% of the critical temperature. So below the critical temperature, we have this cubic form where we have two values for the pressure uh, sorry, two value for the vo two value for the volume for a given pressure, right? In fact, all those points between where, where my mouse is actually moving, all those pressure are going to correspond to two values, all right? So we are going to have a point B1 and a point B2, one that's actually in the repulsive part of the of the equation, right? Where we have this this hard sphere potential, and then one that's in the uh, attractive part. OK, uh, the attractive part is because if you follow this, if you go down here, it actually goes to lower the volume. So in other words, to 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 uh, to optimize the interaction, the, the attraction between the, the molecule. And of course, there is a there is a minimum uh, in this case because uh, it's where the balance of uh, attraction and repulsion lead to a stable uh, uh, composition. Anyways. The point remains that we have those points here. And uh, let's try to understand a little bit what's happening. Uh, OK, so let's go back to what we've done in uh, thermodynamics. <laughs> this is, the course is about thermodynamics. Last time I checked. Uh, the Helmholtz, uh, uh, from the Helmholtz free energy, we can calculate the pressure, right? It's one of the, was one of those fundamental equations we, we've seen before, and the pressure will be, in fact, it comes from the exact differential for F. Uh, this is from the definition of Helmholtz free energy F, anyways. So the pressure is minus dF over dV at, at constant temperature. Now, um, what we can actually calculate the Helmholtz, we can actually evaluate the Helmholtz free energy from this equation and from this equation. So before, let's, let's not worry too much. I'm just going to give you the result. We can find that the Helmholtz uh, free energy is given by this equation. Now, uh, it's, it's one of those cases where it's easier to check that it's right than to try to derive it. So let's do it. So let's try to take the derivative of this function f with respect to the volume okay, at constant temperature. And if you do that, if it work at constant temperature, this derivative, this one is going to go away. The derivative of this is going to be minus RT over V minus B, but there is a minus sign, so it's going to be RT divided by V minus B, this term. And the derivative of this will be minus minus, so plus 1 over V square, so A over V square, but there is another minus, so the 3 minus become, keep 1 minus in here. So in other words, this equation for the Helmholtz free energy is compatible with the Van der Waals interaction term that we have. That's, that's what matters, OK? So this is the, my Helmholtz free energy. The reason why I use Helmholtz is because this is actually an easy equation, an easier equation to, to, uh, to adapt. Now, as you know, very often in a, in a very, here, what we're interested in is a, we're interested in a, in a constant pressure and a constant temperature uh, 
uh, scenario. Uh, so by now you should have the reflex that if you work at constant pressure and constant temperature, the, the actual uh, uh, thermodynamic potential you should consider is the Gibbs free energy, of course, the, key, the Gibbs function. So this is the typical uh, constraint used by, by chemists uh, with constant pressure and temperature. And then you can calculate the Gibbs. And then this is where things get a little bit more complicated. So let's let's try to do this uh, uh, ca calmly. So the Gibbs free energy, the Gibbs function is F plus PV. Uh, uh, lucky for us, we know everything here. We know F from here. And we, of course, know PV, right? We know P and we know V, obviously, so PV here. And so here's what's, what's important about this. Um, OK. Uh, the problem is, if you look at the Gibbs function as a function of pressure, and here, by the way, we have taken the normalized pressure, we divided by the, the critical pressure, but that's, that's fine. Let's not worry too much about this for now. This is just a, this is a matter of renormalizing the axis. Uh, <clears throat> so if we look at this equation here, we will see that because, because there is pressure has two possible volume, for example, B at points B1, B2, the Gibbs function also is also a two a multi-valued function. Okay, it's going to be a two a multi-valued function simply because we have this possible uh, uh, we have two possible uh, volume for a given pressure. Okay, so this is because we have a third order a cubic uh, uh, polynomial for the, for the for the pressure. Now let's try to think for a second here. If those two terms, if those two positions are possible, okay, they, they are means they correspond to the same Gibbs function, right? Why? Because a Gibbs function is, is, is a function that you minimize to get the most stable uh, situation when you work at constant temperature and pressure, right? This is, this is basically the second law of thermodynamics. That means at this point here, this particular point of the Gibbs function, it, these are these are these are the lowest. This is the lowest point of the on the phase diagram to the Gibbs function, and what's what's happening is that that particular point corresponds to two possible volumes. This is the reason why we plot it this way. Now, let's try to let's try to think a little bit how we plotted this thing. We are going to start from very high pressure, so we have very high pressure. We have a liquid, right? Very very high pressure. So we have really put all the molecules close together. Uh, van der Waals inter the Van der Waals uh, law allows for this because it has the attractive and repulsive part. And so you are reducing the pressure slowly, okay? You are reducing the pressure, so you have to go on both those two curves, try to follow those two curves. So you are actually increasing, uh, you, are in you are decreasing the pressure, right? But barely changing the volume because you are in this very hard part. But you And w the fact that you are barely changing the volume is because you have a very... A low compressibility system, it's, it's a liquid. So you keep going down, you keep going down until you reach a point here corresponding to the to the point Y. And at this point, we start to have two possible solutions. We have to have, we start to have two possible solutions for the volume. Okay. And so that means that starting at this point, we can have two possible solutions, one that corresponds to a large value of the Gibbs function and the other one that follows this curve, okay? And so let's continue on this curve for now and we'll look at the other curve in a second. So we get to this point B that I discussed before. And this point B is the point where we still have uh, the Gibbs function, so with the lower Gibbs function. Now we can consider that we are going to stay close to the point B1, all right? So, so we follow B1. And so the point is the, the volume is continue along this line, and so you continue along this line here. So this is going to be the Gibbs function corresponding to this branch. Nice. Now suppose that you start from very low pressure over here. So we are going to follow this, and this is a gas, very low pressure. It's a gas, and the Gibbs function uh, is going to go uh, is actually going to, to to go to go up in this case at this given pressure. Uh, I mean, which is fine. Pressure is a, is a parameter that we impose. And it's going to, to follow this curve until it reaches this point. Uh, uh, in fact, it reaches this point here, corresponding to x, where it's a two-valued uh, two function. Okay. Now, we are going to follow this, this branch. 
And now we keep following this branch continuously until we arrive to this point. Again, we had at this point, we follow the gas uh, curve and we follow the liquid curve. And then we know that in between there were two other possibilities. Okay. I mean, there were one other possibility for each curve. So let's try to do it again. We start from here. And maybe at this point, instead of following this curve, we could have jumped to this point. Okay, because it's a given pressure. So I could have jumped to this point. Okay. So basically, and I and, and I probably ask, it's probably a good idea to pause and, and try to convince yourself. What's happening is that you have two possibilities, two solutions, once you are between the point Y and the point X. Because between these two points, there are two solutions, two different possible volumes for a given pressure. And those two different volume values for the volume at a given pressure translate into two possible uh, solutions for the Gibbs function. And so they are plotted here. One that's continuous, two that are continuous, and two that are discontinuous. Now, what's nice about this, of course, we know that the system will always try to get the lower uh, Gibbs, uh, to try to minimize the, the, the Gibbs function, right? This is the second law of thermodynamics. So in other words, uh, the point here is that we are going to jump from one situation to the next one right here. It's going to follow this curve, but it's not going to continue here. Instead, it's going to jump here and follow here because that corresponds to the lowest Gibbs function. Now, what about the points, the other points? Well, it turns out that these, these points here, uh, so we remains on ABC. Uh, so I already explained all this here. This point here uh, correspond, this particular point correspond to two solutions that are that correspond to the same Gibbs function, so they coexist, one that's a liquid and one that's a, a gas. Okay. Now it turns out that even though this branch here has higher Gibbs function, therefore is not, a, not the, the preferred path, this one would be the preferred path. This can actually be short-lived. This can, this, this so B, from B to X could actually exist for, for as a transient, if you will, for a given amount of time. And the same for here, okay? So this critical point correspond to, to a place where you have a coexistence of liquid and gas, which you can also have special case. You can have, you can have a, so this, this is a metastable. You can have a super, sub, superheated liquid in this area, or you could have a super cool gas in this area. So even though the, this area here should correspond to, to, uh, to a high pressure, therefore to a liquid, you can also continue this branch between B and Y that correspond to a gas, which would be actually a super cool gas. And same, same idea here. So this is one of those uh, graphs that's a little bit harder to, to explain uh, and to understand. But I like to, I like to, to remind you what's important to understand here is the fact that this PV curve, okay, this PV curve for a certain, for all the pressure between X and Y can have two solutions for the volume. Okay, there are two possible solutions for the volume. And um, those two possible solutions for the volume translate to the fact that the Gibbs a function can have two solutions as well for a given pressure. We know that nature will follow the lowest Gibbs uh, function possible. But the point is that the crossover here, okay, where the two, where you jump from one branch to the other, correspond to the coexistence of liquid and gas. And you can also have this uh, short-lived uh, phases, which do not correspond to the lowest Gibbs function, but they could actually uh, take, uh, exist for a short, short period of time. In other words, it could be transient. So this is, this is the hardest uh, uh, slide of the entire lecture that I, that I want to explain. Uh, this is not over. We're going to continue studying this, but this is, this is probably the most difficult uh, uh, concept to, to get. Now, um, let's, let's study uh, this a little bit more quantitatively. So we know that uh, we have the Gibbs, Gibbs fun uh, function is equal at, at those points. Now we can also calculate the change in the Gibbs function when we go between one pressure and another one, and of course, this is just a definition uh, from, from calculus, you know, uh, fundamental uh, theorem of, of, of uh, differential equations. And then we can, we can also remember 
that uh, from, from the definition of the Gibbs function, that the derivative of the Gibbs function with respect to pressure at, at, at constant temperature is the volume. So we can, we can replace this here. And so we can obtain this general equation. This is always true. Now, uh, imagine that you want to calculate the Gibbs function going from, from, uh, from B1 to B2, right? Going from B1 to B2. You want, you want to see the change in the Gibbs function going from B1 to B2. Well, you know the change. There is no change. These two points correspond to the same value of the Gibbs function. Uh, these, are, these are the two points that, where those two curves cross. So basically, GB at, at, at P2, B2 and, and uh, the, the pressure at B2 and pressure at B1, uh, we can write this uh, from this equation. And of course, we know these two values are the same. This is, this is actually the same, the same pressure. And uh, so that means that since these two things are equal, that means that the integral between B1 and B2 for VDP is equal to zero. So now this, this, this is very important because that means that if you integrate the volume uh, between B1 and B2, uh, 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 basically from here to here, okay, you obtain, you obtain zero. Well, you know that uh, you, one of the interpretations of the, of the integral is a surface area under the curve. And so this particular uh, condition, that, that, that condition is imposed from the fact that we have the coexistence of those two phases. Uh, that particular condition can be can be understood uh, uh, schematically by re-rotating this by 90 degrees. So we rotate this by 90 degrees. So we have a PV curve, and we see that if we if we move uh, if we move the curve if we find the the, the right place so the, like the dashed line where the the surface area here and the surface area here compensate. So it's a negative uh, it's a negative surface area because it's below the below the curve and the positive surface area. If we find the place where those two surface area compensate exactly, we obey this condition. And if we obey this condition, we found the point B1 and B2. So this is how we, opt this is how we identify the point B1 and B2 in those curves. Now, uh, this is called the Maxwell construction. And this construction is, is, is completely explained by this. And it's, it allows you to identify which points, at which points on those curves, which pressure correspond to the coexistence of a liquid and a gas. I think it's pretty nice from this from this model. Okay, uh, we do not have that if we use the ideal gas law. So just to summarize, uh, if we if we look at at, at the critical point, uh, at the critical point we we see that we have uh, the coexistence on this on, on this curve here on this curve between the liquid and gas. We have the coexistence of liquid and gas. Um, and, uh, and then we can transform gas into liquid. But if we are above uh, the critical point, there is no there is no sharp transition anymore. So it is a, it's, that's the way that's the way things work. This is just a summary of what we've done so far. Let's move now to the diary chai equation. Uh, there is chai equation. It's going to be hard for me to pronounce this uh, properly, but we'll see what happens. Uh, which is essentially. Uh, um, an improved model upon the Van der Waals uh, description. Uh, we are going to spend actually less time on this because the, uh, the the math is very much the same as what we've done before. But let's try to understand a little bit the difference between what we've done here compared to Van der Waals. So remember the Van der Waals interaction, the Van der Waals uh, equation was about uh, two terms, a repulsive and an attractive term. So the, the repulsive term was a hard fear interaction simply coming from the fact that we shift the volumes. In other words, we say that the molecules have a finite volume. And the attractive term uh, was simply minus A over V squared. We explained this. Uh, and one of the limitations of this is that we use A as the effective uh, interaction, an average interaction, and it did not depend at all on, on, on the size. A did not depend on the size. It turns out that a number of people have tried to improve this. For example, Bert Bertolo equation as uh, Bertolo has tried uh, proposed to to have an attractive term that actually depends on the temperature. So ver various people came up with improvement about the attractive uh, interaction, um, and so uh, uh, Daya Ritschai came up with a different description, very much uh, along the lines of what's 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 done here. But now. The, 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 pre, the, the, the correction due to attraction was actually introduced as an exponential of minus A over RTV. So this is a, this is more, um, 
this is this is actually um, uh, it, it decays faster with volume because it's an exponential. It actually turns out that, as we are going to see in a second, more uh, realistic to describe actual gas. So this is basically another uh, mathematical formulation for uh, the physics that we are trying to describe. So what's important to remember here is that we have the, the fundamental uh, understanding that we developed for the, with the Van der Waals uh, law. Uh, here, it's essentially a correction, uh, an improvement, if you will. It's not fundamentally new or fundamentally different. It's an improvement uh, in the functional form. So the equation that we end up with is, is this equation here um, for the um, for the Dyer uh, Ritz, uh, Ritzi equation. Equation. Okay. Uh, we can also plot the isotherm for this, and the isotherm again, it's what we always say p uh, as a function of, of volume, uh, and then um, with the reduced pressure and reduced volume here, we can always do this and. Uh, just the same way as we did each line correspond to a different temperature. So basically it's like using this equation with temperature as a parameter and we plot different lines. And once again, we have behavior that looks very much like the ideal gas at high temperature and start to have this inflection point and then this minimum, mini, this, this local minimum and so on and so forth at lower temperature or lower volume and so on. So same story as we said for the Van der Waals uh, law but with uh, something that actually turns out to be more realistic for the actual interaction. So we can calculate the critical point in, in this model. And again, same idea, we calculate the, the first and second derivative. And if we impose them to be equal to zero, then it's going to be an uh, inflection point. And this is where you start to have a local minimum and all the things that we discussed before. And then we find when we do this, and I'm not going to do it here, it's, it's very elementary, we find the critical temperature, critical pressure, and critical volume, which is now 2p, instead of 3b, if you remember, for the, for the Van der Waals gap. Now, remember, I also attracted your attention to the fact that the ratio PCVC over RTC did not depend on A and B for the Van der Waals uh, model. Turns out it does not depend on A and B for this model either. And we find a constant, 2 over E squared, which is 0 0.271. Uh, if you remember, for the Van der Waals uh, model, we had 3.8, so 0, 0.375. So that's nice because now if we can, if we can measure those, that ratio, we can see how good the models are. And in fact, this has been done for a number of, of systems like neon, argon, krypton, xenon, so the, the, the noble gas. And this ratio is a measure of how well the systems are described. And you can see that these numbers, of course, are not exactly the same as what we find in this improved model. But they are pretty close, I would say. I mean, within within 10% uh, for sure, uh, which is and in fact they are much much closer to the new model than they were from the Van der Waals. But the fundamental understanding is the same. It's just that we are changing uh, the attraction. Uh, we are actually fine tuning the attraction. Fundamentally, the idea is that we included the repulsion and the attraction in the model. We can actually go further. There have been many models uh, proposed for the for the gas law. Uh, we can do it in a more systematic way. And as you know, as physicists by now, you know, doing something systematic can be done by using a, uh, uh, a series of uh, orthogonal uh, uh, polynomials, for example, you, by, for example, using Fourier transform, adding more and more terms, or using a Taylor series and adding more and more terms. So that allows you to do an expansion that's more and more accurate. At least it's the goal. Well, the virial expansion is actually related to this, this fundamental idea that you use a Taylor uh, function, a uh, Taylor series, and uh, you actually add terms to the series to get something more and more uh, accurate. Well, this is the idea. So what we do, we are going to consider is that the ideal gas law, the reason why it works so well is just because it was, it was a zeroth order term in a Taylor series. And... Um, we didn't, I didn't prove that yet, I'm going to say that, but we are going to build a framework, which is called the virial expansion, where we will say that the ideal gas law is a zeroth order term in Taylor series. I'm going to show you how, how it's done. And then we can also say, well, maybe the, we can also do that for the Van der Waals uh, law, which is probably um, more than zeroth order, maybe first order, maybe second order. We're going to see that in a second. So this is, this is the idea. So basically, uh, here's, here's what, uh, when you do a Taylor series, you have to think about which variable to, 
to tailor uh, developed, right? Now, since the beginning of this lecture, I've been, I've been insisting a lot on the fact that one way to make the system more and more behave like an ideal gas is by increasing the molar volume. So if you have very high molar volume, in, a word, in other words, if you have very high, a very low density of molecules, then the ideal gas law works pretty well. And the reason for that is because the molecule have less chance to interact with each other. So in other words, it's fine to neglect the interaction. So it looks like the larger the molar, molar, molar volume, the more accurate the ideal gas law is. So it, it looks like if we want to use a Taylor series where we decree, where we have a low, a small, when we want things to be accurate for low value of a variable, it looks like one over the volume should be a good, a good idea. And so this is exactly what the virial theorem expansion does. And I'm going to write it here. And the virial expansion is like this. It's going to be PV over RT and is equal to this Taylor expansion, okay? And Taylor expansion with respect to one over VM. We, why is that so? Well, because we know that when VM is infinite, the ideal gas law should be per exact. And in fact, uh, well, of course you have a VM here as well, but the idea is on the right hand side. The point is that PV over RT should be equal to one when VM is, is fairly large. Uh, and that means that your PV RT equal one is the ideal gas law, okay? So at least we can always find the coefficients here that are going to, to work. So we can, we can do this. And maybe we can hope to use this framework to, to see that we can make a, a systematic improvement. Uh, I'm going to show you that, for example, the Van der Waals uh, model can be fit into this, into this model easily. And so we'll see how things get improved. So let's say a word about the B and C coefficients. I call the variable coefficients. And they are temperature dependent. So we can actually add more to the, uh, to the description. Uh, in fact, there is something that's very important here. Uh, uh, if you remember one of the very first lecture we did, we talked about Boyle's law. And the Boyle's law, uh, which was an experimental law, was that the pressure was uh, inversely proportional to the volume, right? And that was the Boyle's law. Now, we know that if we, for example, if we neglect, neglect all the terms above B over Vm, uh, the pressure will be proportional to one of the volume if B is equal to zero, okay? So if B equal to zero, we find Boyle's law. The ball slope PV is equal to a constant, basically. Uh, so b since B is temperature dependent, maybe there is a value of the temperature where B equal is, will be equal to zero. And if B equal to zero and we neglect all the other terms, we'll find the ball slope. Actually, we call the, the, the place with the, the, the B coefficient here, uh, which is, which is uh, temperature dependent, the place where it gets to zero is going to call, is be called the ball temperature. So this is just something that's uh, that's, uh, that, that's a number that, uh, that you can find in tables and in describing gas. So let's just remind you, if B equal to zero at a given temperature, which is called the Boyle temperature, we of course recover the, Boyle, uh, the Boyle's law, which is P proportional to one over P. Very good. Uh, let's try to apply this to the Van der Waals equation. So I've already used this form for the pressure uh, in a, a few slides ago. So we can write it this way. And remember, we are trying to do a um, Taylor expansion over one over V. So let's try to do that. Uh, and so we can write this uh, like this way. We can write it this way, uh, just, just reordering things. It's not unusual to do it this way when we have a, a large volume value of V, for example. Uh, we like to do Taylor series of this term. I'm going to, uh, to remind you what the Taylor series of this is in a second. So. The question is, how can we write this equation into the, the form for the variables uh, expansion? So how can we do this? Well, we can write, uh, I, I just repeated, uh, I just repeated this, uh, I just rewrote this equation here with making sure that I have PV over RT on the left-hand side, and I end up with this equation. Now, we know that in order to do a Taylor series, we're going to have to do a Taylor series of this. So let me remind you a Taylor series that we use a lot in physics, which is one minus X over minus one, which is just simply the geometric series, one plus X plus X squared and so on. So in other words, this term here, one minus B of V to the power minus one for is, is 
very well described by this series, one plus BV plus BV squared and so on and so forth. So I'm going to actually plug that in here and we find uh, we can actually reorder thing, but we of course have to collect this term, which is one over V uh, in here. All right, so that we have all the terms of one over V and so on and so forth. And so what we find by doing this is that this, the Van der Waals equation also fits uh, this variable expansion so long as we say that the B coefficient, so B here, is equal to B minus A over RT. And you see, of course, B of T, as, as, as we posited uh, last, at the previous slide, is indeed temperature dependent. Okay, it's temperature dependent right here. Uh, well, of course, you can calculate the Boltz temperature. The Boltz temperature is when B is equal to zero. And of course, this is a very simple thing to do. We just have to make sure that this is equal to zero and we find the Boltz temperature uh, in the Van der Waals uh, model is A over BR. So this is, this is nice. Uh, good. Now, one last thing I want to tell you about. Uh, we have all those models and so on and so forth. And then we know that uh, we actually don't have that many models and, and they work for a very large uh, array of, of systems, large array of, of molecules. Um, and we know that we have very few coefficients and we, we see that the fundamental properties that we, we found from, for example, the Van der Waals equation was those critical points. The critical point is the place where you have the coexistence of a liquid and uh, a gas, and they have the same Gibbs uh, energy, therefore they, are, they coexist. So the, these, these are fundamental properties of the equations. Uh, but of course, these values, so the critical pressure, critical volume, critical temperature, they depend on the coefficient A and B. A and B are obviously um, material dependent, molecule dependent. So the idea though, if that if you go back to the equation, you will see that if you renormalize your equation, so that instead of using the pressure, volume, and temperature, you, you are using a reduced coordinates where you normalize with respect to these fundamental properties like critical pressure, critical volume, critical, uh, critical temperature. You, you see that the behavior, so the phase diagrams, became, become almost identical, especially when they fit very well the model. So very often we, we call this the, the law of corresponding states. The law of corresponding state is basically saying that you can have a universal law by using the appropriate coordinates, which are the reduced coordinates. Okay, this is, this is just something that we do uh, for, for convenience almost. Uh, it's, just, it's just a translation of the fact that the models like the Van der Waals equation and so on and so forth are, uh, w work really well and then can, be, uh, can work really well for, for different uh, uh, type of, of system. So uh, we can apply this to the Van der Waals gas. Again, this is the equation of the Van der Waals gas. Uh, I have remind you of the value of the temperature, critical temperature, critical volume, and critical pressure. And then you can rewrite, you can, you can actually translate the, the equation that we have right here uh, using the uh, reduced coordinates, which are obtained by normalizing by these three values. And after very uh, simple, simple, simple math, you end up with uh, this equation here uh, that's described as a function of the, uh, which is described as a function of the uh, reduced coordinates, uh, P tilde, V tilde, and so on. So it's another way to write this without the A and B coefficients anymore. And these equations are kind of universal and depends on this critical, critical point. So one thing that, that one of the reasons why these things work really well is that it, one thing that, that I did not describe here, but uh, I, I just like to, to say a few words about, the interacting potential, uh, like the Van der Waals potential, for example, uh, in fact, looks very much like this, okay? Uh, and, and let me explain to you why, why we have something similar. So, so we did not plot this yet. V is the potential, R is the distance between molecules. Uh, there is an attractive force which, which, we, which, uh, which we introduce, and then the repulsive one. Uh, and the repulsive one is the Hartz field potential. In other words, it's a, it's a potential that does not allow the molecule to get very close to one another. And this is a very sharp one, right? It's a hard sphere, so very, very quickly, very, very hard potential, as we call it. But the addition of a repulsive uh, term, and an, so repulsive term means that the gradient goes towards increasing distances. Uh, and then the attractive terms where the gradient goes towards decreasing distances, right? I try to attract and create bonds, basically. Uh, 
uh, the, the, so the addition of repulsion and, and attraction can lead to a minimum. And this is going to be the place where the, the system is going to be stable when the distance between the, for example, the molecules or the particles in general will be equal to, to this. And that the, the depth of that potential will be equal to a certain number epsilon, minus epsilon, in fact. So, so what is trying to, what this is saying is that this is another way to translate the fact of the A and B values. And these potential are fairly universal. Many, many systems behave using this kind of potential. And so it's not surprising that if you use reduced coordinates where those R min and epsilon, which are material dependent, are basically renormalized, just the same way as we did for the, corresp the corresponding state, we should be able to, to have a universal understanding of, of what's happening. And in fact, on the right-hand side here, it's an example uh, that's, that's, that, that I copied from, from the, the, the book, the Blundell and Blundell's book that we, we have been following uh, very closely in, in this uh, screencast. Uh, this is an example of a place where we see that all the different data, experimental data for a large array of, of gas fit uh, very well on one curve. Uh, uh, in this case, the density, the reduce, uh, if you will, the, the reduced density with respect to reduced temperature, uh, actually the reduced temperature is a function of reduced uh, density. Uh, they, they follow a universal law. So this is this is basically the idea here. The point that I want to make about this so that it's not confusing is that the, 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 the strength of these descriptions here is that uh, even though you added attraction and repulsion, which are, which are material dependent, you can still make broad uh, uh, inference about what the model predicts. Uh, like the critical uh, effect, like uh, the coexistence of, of gas and liquid, all this by using uh, these reduced coordinates, if you will, uh, which which basically remove the material specific properties to highlight the physics of, of what's happening. So this is uh, now time to go to the last slide. As always, I was a summary. Uh, we've done a, we've we've actually learned a lot in this in this uh, lecture, I believe, uh, going beyond the ideal gas law. And we started with Van der Waals equation, which, which basically uh, added a repulsion term, uh, the fact that the, the atom, the, the molecules, atoms or particles or whatever have a finite size, and an attractive term. The attractive term is actually being an effective uh, uh, pressure, okay? Because uh, the fact that there is an attraction is equivalent to like work, if you will, that's done. That's, that's how we we, we justified the uh, A plus B square uh, M. Um, we also came up with an improved model with a dyer uh, Ritchie equation. So this is the last time I'm going to say that, that name today. Uh, and this equation is actually uh, a, an improvement upon Van der Waals. And we found this by looking, by looking at uh, um, a specific uh, ratio and comparing it with experimental data. But the fundamental uh, interaction were actually understood and introduced with the Van der Waals equation. We show there is a way to systematically improve this, this solution by lo looking at the virial expansion of a gas. The beauty of this expansion is that it, 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 it highlights the, the, the level of improvement you do going from ideal gas to, to uh, Van der Waals and so on and so forth. So basically it's a systematic improvement and we, we kind of have a a uh, uh, more universal uh, description of, of the different models. So it, it, this is quite satisfactory from a, from a fundamental and, and formal point of view. Uh, we also discussed the, the law of corresponding states, uh, but I believe that the, the hardest part of this, of this slide, of this uh, lecture, was about the, the coexistence of the liquid and, and gas at the critical, um, the critical isotherm. And, I invite you to make sure you spend enough time reviewing that part. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. And um, next lecture, we will be uh, talking about cooling. Thank you.